Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We start the video six on genetic technology, and this is nine seven double zero syllabus A two biology. We're going to discuss in this video herbicide resistant crops, insecticide resistant crops, and the golden rice. So the first discussion we do about is how and why do we need these? Now basically these two we need. These two we need to increase the crop yield. So increase crop yield means more food for people on earth. More food because you have the land is the same. So more food if you have more uh, more crop yield means more fruit available. Like if you're growing wheat, so we need more of the wheat seeds. If we are growing sugar cane, we need more of the sugar cane the stem. If we are growing corn, well, we need the fruit of the corn. So, if we have herbicide-resistant crops and insecticide-resistant crops, we're going to increase the crop yield. That is the basic aim that we are targeting. First of all, I want you to basically understand. This is called the shikimate pathway. Now, I don't want to go into great details of it, but what is it going to do? It's going to convert phosphoenol pyruvate. Combines with erythrose four phosphate. Don't have to remember the names. Two something, and that is converted to three D hydroquinate, then D hydro shikimate, and then shikimate, and then shikimate three phosphate. None of the names you've got to remember. The only thing you've got to remember is that there is an enzyme which is needed here. That enzyme is called EPSPS. EPSPS. What does this stand for? E P S P S. There's a synthase at the end, right? Now, what we're targeting is we're targeting this E P S P synthase, and the E P S P synthase is an enzyme, as you can tell, is A S E. There's an enzyme here, synthase. And what does that do? It actually catalyzes this reaction, which results in 5-enol pyruvyl shikimate 3 phosphate, which is called EPSP. So it is why is it called EPSP synthase? Because it results in the formation of EPSP. So you can see the formation of EPSP is taking place. So EPSP formed, and then something else formed, chorismate, and that results in the formation of number one tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine. Now you must remember. Plants have to make their own amino acids. They can only photosynthesize and they can make glucose. But then the glucose and nitrate and all that is a long story. And then it results in the formation of amino acids. Now that's absolutely essential for a plant. So if we spray a chemical called glyphosate. If we spray a chemical called glyphosate, what does it do? It knocks out EPSP synthase. No more APSP synthase, it, it, it just disables it. So no APSP synthase, so no amino acids being made, and the plant is going to die. It's a basically a very essential chemical pathway for the, for the plant to be able to make its own amino acids. And then it is going to result in the growth of the plant. So what we do is, we, if we use a chemical which is going to stop this EPSP synthase, that means this plant is going to die. So first of all, I want you to understand this, and then I will tell you how we are going to use this glyphosate. This is the action of glyphosate. Glyphosate is a pesticide, and it binds to and blocks EPSPS. This enzyme is located within the chloroplast. It catalyzes the reaction of shikimate 3-phosphate and phosphoenol pyruvate to form 3-enol pyruvyl shikimate 3-phosphate. So, I mean, I don't want you to know all these names, but what I want you to know is what are we targeting? We are targeting that enzyme EPSPS. And the chemical we are using is glyphosate. This is the enzyme which we are talking about. What does it mean? immaterial but basically it's an enzyme the word synthase tells you it's an enzyme it results in the formation of this molecule 5 enol pyruvyl shikimate 3 phosphate so this is the enzyme that we are targeting first of all we need to understand what we mean by herbicide resistant crops you see the crop which we growing which is the main cash crop it could be any crop 
Now, when we start growing it and when we start planting the seed and it starts to germinate and the crop starts to grow, so it starts to grow fine. But then we have a problem. We have these weeds growing in between. Now, why are we so upset about these weeds? Well, we are upset about these weeds because they are also competing for the nutrients in the soil. If you've added a fertilizer, well, they're taking up the fertilizer as well. And then they're going to grow and then they're going to shade it from light. So plants, the cash crop which we want to grow is not going to grow taller. It's the weeds which are growing to grow taller. So if the weeds are going to grow taller, then they're going to be competing for light. We don't want that to be happening. So we want to somehow, we want to kill all the weeds. So we want to kill all the weeds. So what we do is we spray a chemical. Now the chemical that we spray is called glyphosate which I've just talked about. And when this chemical is sprayed, what happens? All these weeds die. Because basically, the glyphosate stops the pathway, the shikimate pathway, and stops the plant from making its own amino acids. So when we spray glyphosate, what happens? All the weeds are killed. All the weeds die. All the weeds which were competing with the cash crop, they all die. But what have we done? What have we done? We have somehow genetically engineered these herbicide resistant crops. Now, what have we done to them? What have we done that they don't die? They do not die of the glyphosate, but the weeds are all dying from the glyphosate. So please understand this. What have we done? We've used genetic technology. We have genetic technology. We've used genetic technology to change the crops, the cash crops which we need, we've made them glyphosate resistant. Now what does that mean? Why? How have they become glyphosate resistant? The reason they've become glyphosate resistant is that we have put in these crop plants a soil bacterium gene that produces a glyphosate which is a tolerant form of the EPSPS. that produces a glyphosate tolerant form of the EPS. Remember EPSPS was that EPSP synthase, that enzyme. So this EPSP synthase is not destroyed by glyphosate. Either we've done this or we have used a soil bacterium gene that produces a glyphosate degrading enzyme. So even if we've sprayed glyphosate, this crop, this cash crop of ours produces something which actually destroys the glyphosate. So our cash crop survives while the weeds are killed. So please understand how we have actually genetically changed, engineered the cash crops and we have made them resistant to glyphosate. Either we put them a gene in which there is a glyphosate tolerant form of EPSPS or we have put in a gene that produces a glyphosate degrading enzyme. So this is how the crops that we want to grow, they grow better. So we have a better crop yield, we have more food, we have more money, while the weeds will die. So this is called herbicide resistant crops. But then we have some worries. We have some environmental worries. The most likely detrimental effect on the environment of growing a herbicide resistant crop are what? Number one, this genetically modified crop which we have made will become an agricultural weed. It will spread so rapidly because it won't be killed by any chemical. So it will become an agricultural weed. Now that would be disastrous. Number two, we have another very uh, scary uh, thought that if the pollen transfer to the gene to the wild relatives, then it could produce hybrid offsprings that are invasive weeds. So one I said was this genetically modified could become an agricultural weed. Number two, I said if the pollen is transferred and then it results in hybrid offsprings that are invasive weeds. And the third is, of course, the most uh, troublesome, is that these herbicide-resistant weeds, you see the ones which these uh, will evolve, the ones which we had, the weeds that we had, 
which were being destroyed by the glyphosate, these will evolve and become because so much of the same herbicide is used, so they might become resistant to the glyphosate. Same herbicide is used, glyphosate. So a time might come that these weeds also become resistant to it and they are no longer destroyed by the glyphosate. Of course, then of course it becomes a problem, then you have to use another chemical to kill the weeds. Then we come to the next topic which is called insect resistant crops. Insect resistant crops are the ones in which we have actually introduced some sort of a gene which produces a toxin and when some insects come and start to eat the leaves of this plant then those insects just die. So Another important agricultural development is that of genetically modified plants protected against attack by insect pests. Maize, corn, is protected against the corn borer which eats the leaves of the plant and then burrows into the stalk, eating its way upwards and the plant cannot support the air. So insect resistant tobacco also exists and is protected against the tobacco budworm. So, we find we are happy with this because this of course again as the insects are destroyed so this will increase the crop yield and that is what we want we want increase in crop yield but then what is the bad effects on the environment the evolution of resistance by the insect pest the insect pest might evolve and get resistant to that bt toxin gene which we have put in it or it might damage on the other species of insects as well, because we don't know, we, we just, we just, it's just generally an insect resistant crop. What about the other insect which might be destroyed? And of course the biggest worry is the transfer of the added gene to other species of plant. You see, we, in this insect resistant crop, we've added a gene in the crop. So the gene which has been added is in the crop. Now this gene is added and this crop produces a toxin which kills the insects. What if this added gene goes into other species of plants and more and more insects are destroyed? What about the pollinators? What about the bees? So this is going to upset the entire ecosystem because we are destroying all the pollinators so if the pollinators are destroyed, that's going to have an effect on the vegetation, on the plants. Pollinators are absolutely essential in insect pollinated plants. So if there are no pollinators and no pollination, no fruit formation, no seed formation, and those plants will eventually die. So we really are worried about all these effects, though we are genetically engineering all this stuff to increase the crop yield. But are we really creating a lot of imbalance in nature? We really don't know. Now let's come to the topic of the golden rice. Now the golden rice, why did it come into, uh, why are we talking about it in this chapter is there's a reason for that. The reason is that rice is a staple food in many parts of the world and many countries, you know, everybody eats just rice and here of course we eat uh, roti or chapati but in other countries maybe there are some people will eat a lot of potatoes in certain countries there's a lot of people like in Bangladesh rice is a very common food. Now people are poor and rice forms a major part of their diet. Now deficiency of vitamin A is a common and serious problem. Vitamin A deficiency can cause blindness. The World Health Organization estimates that nearly 500,000 children go blind each year as a result of vitamin A deficiency. Even more importantly, lack of vitamin A can cause an immune deficiency syndrome. And this is a significant cause of children dying, mortality. And it is estimated that in 2010, more than two and a half million children died of vitamin A deficiency. So that is, of course, the main worry that we have. But then vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin found in oily fish and animal products such as egg, milk, cheese, liver. It is also made in our bodies from carotene, the orange carotenoid pigment found in carrots. Now, all these facts are that these foods are not really readily available to the poor people. 
So what should we do? The children of families living in poverty often lack animal products in their diet. So the main thing is that they're poor because they're too expensive. So such children have a diet containing a wide range of vegetables rich in carotenoids. It's still difficult for them to avoid vitamin A deficiency. So what did we come up with? We came up with a form of rice which has high levels of vitamin A. So in people eating rice would just get extra vitamin A and then of course all this problem would be solved. So this is what genetic technology came into place that let's grow rice which of course we called it the golden rice which would then have more vitamin A and everybody could eat that because even the poor people can buy rice and even the rich people can buy rice. So this was the main reason behind golden rice. Now what did we do? We took the genes for the production of carotene from maize and the bacterium Pantonia ananatis so we took it from maize and bacteria, forget the names. These genes together with promoters were inserted into plasmids. Then the plasmids were inserted into bacteria called agrobacterium tumefaciens. Now this bacteria has a natural habit or a natural uh, desire to infect plants. These bacteria naturally infect plants so could introduce the genetically modified plasmids into rice cells. They were mixed with rice embryos in the petri dishes and the rice embryos were infected by the bacteria carrying the carotene gene. The rice embryos now containing the carotene genes were grown into adult plants. They produce seeds containing carotene in their endosperm. Basically, the carotene is converted into vitamin A. It's a precursor of vitamin A. So this is how we genetically engineered the rice plant to give us rice, the seed rice, because that's what we eat. We don't eat the plant. We don't eat the leaves. We don't eat the stems. We don't eat the roots. We only eat the seeds. Rice is a seed. So the seeds contain extra carotene. In fact, the leaves contain carotene, but we don't eat the leaves. So the rice would have more vitamin A, so everybody would e eat this rice and everybody would just have more vitamin A and we would solve the problem of vitamin A deficiency among children. This was the whole essence of the golden rice. Now what did we do, uh, what have we done about genetically modified animals? Well we've come up with uh, some sort of a new suggestion is that we could modify uh, genetically the Atlantic salmon. Salmon is a type of fish. So what did we do? We took a growth hormone regulating gene from a Pacific Chinook salmon and a promoter from another species of fish, an ocean pout, and we injected this into a fertilized egg of an Atlantic salmon. Fertilized egg of an Atlantic. So we have a fertilized egg and then we have put in this desired genetic information into this besides its own genetic information. We've injected this into the fertilized egg of an Atlantic salmon. Now when this egg grows up into a fish, that fish is producing growth hormone throughout the year. And this salmon is able to grow all the year round. Usually salmon just grow in the spring and the summer. So as a result, these fish reach market size. Market size means when you're able to sell it in the market in only 18 months, while a normal fish would take three years to grow to this size. Now, of course, we have a lot of problems with this is if this escapes and these genetically modified animals then go into the wild, what would happen? We would have lots of problems. So this is still, we have, this has led the US Food and Drug Administration to declare that they are highly unlikely to have any significant offense on the environment and as safe as food as conventional Atlantic salmon. And we propose to rear only sterile females. 
and to farm them in land based tanks so this is trying to play it safe we might get it wrong so this is the genetically modified animals that we're talking about and the one that we talk about is the fish which we are going to genetically modify so that it can produce the growth hormone all the year round so it will grow faster so within 18 months it will grow to the size which it was supposed to grow in 3 years so this is one example of genetically modified animals now coming to the last topic in this chapter and that will be finishing this chapter social implications of using genetically modified organisms in food production now the first social implication is the modified crop plant may become an agriculture weed or invade natural habitat the second is can this introduced gene be transferred by pollen to other wild relatives whose hybrid offspring may become more invasive so this is one point the third point is that the introduced gene may be transferred by pollen to unmodified plants growing on a farm with organic certification the next is the modified plants may be a direct hazard to humans we don't know eating this insect resistant uh, maize crop is it going to affect us in any way or not is it going to be a direct hazard to humans or domestic animals or other beneficial animals by being toxic or producing allergy you see allergies are increasing and is it because of these genetically modified plants and their products that we are consuming then the herbicide that can now be used on the crop will leave toxic residues in the crop i mean like we use spring glyphosate but glyphosate we say kills the weeds does, does it in any way produce some toxic thing on the crops and if that is an edible crop please understand there are two types of crops like cotton is not an edible crop tobacco is not an edible crop jute is not an edible crop edible means things that we eat so are we okay with using these on edible crops in which we are eating it and then we don't know and maybe after 10 or 11 years or 12 years we find out oh my god this causes allergy this causes kidney stones this causes cancer then the next point is that genetically modified seeds are expensive as is herbicide and their cost may remove any advantage of growing a resistant crop and another very big social implication is that growers mostly need to buy seed each season keeping costs high unlikely for traditional varieties where the grower kept seed from one crop to sow for the next you see if you have a crop and you have the traditional variety where well, you would keep the seed for next year but the growers will have to buy these genetically modified seeds every season so they need to now spend more money so will it is it really worth it or not and the last social implication is in parts of the world where there is a lot of genetically modified crops are grown there is a danger of losing the traditional varieties with their desirable background genes for particular localities and their possibly unknown traits that might be useful in a world where the climate is changing this requires a program of growing and harvesting traditional varieties and setting up a seed bank to preserve them you see traditional varieties are the ones which were present before this gm crops so we had traditional uh, chickpeas we had traditional wheat we had traditional rice now we have getting these genetically modified crops now those traditional varieties might be having that the genome could have been better they could have been drought resistant they could have been uh, maybe they could survive longer periods without rain they could survive longer periods without a lot of fertilizer they just needed a very small amount of uh, nitrates in the soil so all these factors are being considered and we discuss the social implications of genetically modified organisms in food production now this was the last video on the chapter on genetic technology i know this is the worst and the most difficult chapter but i hope this helps you all uh, in this uh, video we have discussed herbicide resistant crops insecticide resistant crops golden rice 
genetically modified animals and the social implications of using genetically modified organisms in food production. I hope this is helpful and this completes uh, nearly all the videos on the A2 biology syllabus and I wish you all the best. Thank you.